Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Hey, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love and your grace and your mercy. Lord, for your forgiveness. We need it so much. God, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus. And in this season, Lord, we celebrate his birth. Lord, we celebrate that he left heaven because of us, because he loved us so much, because you loved us. Lord, we also celebrate his life, Lord, his death and his resurrection, that we could have eternity with you. God, pour your spirit out here this morning and draw your people into your presence. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able, let's go ahead and stand for this first song.
Gracious Father, we thank you for, for meeting us, us in this place today. Thank you, Lord, for, for being our God and for being our Father, for being our Savior. And Lord, we ask that you would help us just to worship you and to please you today. Guide us as you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Well, welcome in Jesus' name. You can be seated. <clears throat> Merry almost Christmas. Hey, a, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, uh, today, uh, actually at the end of worship, we're going to have a, a little children's program, so we're really looking forward to that. It's always fun to bring the kids out and, uh, as, they, as they minister to us. And then uh, after the second service today, we're going to have uh, a potluck. And then from the potluck, uh, we're going to go Christmas caroling. And uh, we're going to go to a couple of uh, Eagle Lake Village and uh, the, the Riverside, um, I forget what it's actually called, but uh, over there in Riverside, uh, you know, convalescent hospital, and uh, maybe a couple other places. And so uh, if you can stay for that, it'd be, you all, you're all welcome, and it'll just be a great time. Looking forward to it. And then uh, this coming Tuesday, we've got our uh, Christmas Eve candlelight service. It starts here at 7 o'clock, and uh, it's a great time. And, uh, you know, if, if you've got a, a big family, I encourage you to get here early uh, because it gets pretty crowded. But uh, it's just a, a neat time of uh, blending uh, God's Word and different hymns and Christmas carols together and stuff. And so uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's a favorite time of the year. And then because we're doing that Tuesday night, uh, we're not going to have our, our usual Wednesday service because that's Christmas Day. And so... Uh, we'll stay home for that since we're doing the Tuesday night thing. And then the following week, we're going to do uh, uh, our annual New Year's Eve prophecy update. And so that's Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock here. And we're going to talk an awful lot about Israel. Israel's in the news constantly. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're watching the news, what's going on in the world today, uh, Israel takes up a lot of ink, you know, a lot of press time, if you will. And so we're going to be talking about Israel uh, that evening and the prophetic aspects of what's going on there. And then again, because we're doing the, the New Year's Eve thing, uh, the New Year's Day, we're going to stay home and won't have a service that night. But the following Sunday, the 5th, on the evening, we're going to have our worship and communion service that evening. And so I encourage you guys to kind of plan ahead and come out for the, uh, the communion service because it's just, it's so cool to, to refocus in a sense and recalibrate your heart and your mind, your life on, on why we're here, you know, and, and celebrating not only, you know, the nativity of Christ, but also celebrating his sacrifice and appreciating what he's done for us. And so I encourage you guys to come out for that. Anyway, Father God, thank you so much uh, for bringing us here today. Help us, Lord, to worship you and to please you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
country far to see for a king was their intent and to follow the star wherever it went Merry Christmas our king has been born Merry Christmas our Savior is here come worship come praise him Jesus, we celebrate you. And just like the shepherds that came and they worshiped you, Lord. Just like the wise men that came and humbled themselves and bowed before you. Lord, just like the disciples that followed you and sat at your feet. We know that you are the only one worthy of all of our praise. And we worship you, Lord. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever say. could ever breathe live for you oh we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are Jesus. 
could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you
our hands together. Father, we thank you for your presence in our midst, and you're an awesome God, and we're here today to worship you and to please you, and we pray that you would be glorified in this place. So guide us, Lord, guide us as we worship you, as we study you, as we hear your voice. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Jesus' name. You can be seated. At this time, I want to invite our kids up. Kitara, would you grab that microphone so they don't walk on it? Thanks. All right. Keep scooting down, guys. In fact, the two tall guys on the end might have to maybe stand next to them. You gonna get them all? We definitely gotta make room for baby Jesus. There's room in this end. All right. Come here. When I told the kids we were going to be doing this and wearing costumes, one of them told me he wanted to be a mouse. <laughs> Couldn't quite figure out how to work that in, so we're going to have to stick to the biblical script here. <clears throat> now, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Yeah. 
off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. They saw the young, the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gracious Father, we, we thank you for these precious kids. And, and Lord, we ask that truly uh, your hand would be upon them today, as it already is, Lord. And we pray that you would speak to their hearts and bless them. Continue to teach them your ways, Father. Teach them to worship you and to, to seek after you and to draw near to you. Bless those that are ministering to them today, too, Lord. May they simply reflect your love and joy to these kids as we commit them to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, you guys. That was awesome. All right, exit stage left. Careful going down. Okay. All right. And thank you, all you ladies that worked so hard on that. That was awesome. Well, uh, I did forget to mention one announcement and that uh, we're preparing our church to go back to Israel. And so uh, there's flyers out on the counter. If you're, uh, you know, pray about it. A lot of times people don't think they can go. They can't afford it, that kind of thing. But I couldn't afford it the last couple times I went either. But God provides, and it's just an amazing thing. So I want to encourage you guys to prayerfully consider going to Israel with us. But this morning we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. Well, uh, once you get your Bibles open, we're going to read the chapter together, and then we'll go back and we'll, we'll, we'll cruise through it verse by verse. But uh, once you get your Bibles open, if you're able, uh, would you stand with me in, in reverence for God's Word as we read it together? Isaiah chapter 2, beginning now at verse 1, it says... <coughs> The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it came to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law 
and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Our, o house of Jacob, come and, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have forsaken your people, uh, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with eastern ways. They are soothsayers like the Philistines. They are, they are pleased with the children of foreigners. Their land is also full of silver and gold, and there's no end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, and there's no end of their chariots. Their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, and they, they, that which their fingers have made. People bow down, and each man humbles himself. Therefore, do not forgive them. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. The, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low, upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, and upon every fortified wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the beautiful sloops. Uh, the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. But the idols he shall utterly abolish. They shall go uh, into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. In that day a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have made uh, each for himself to worship, uh, to the moles and to the bats, uh, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the crags of the rugged rocks. Uh, from the terror of the Lord, and the glory of his majesty, which he when he arises, shall shake the earth mightily. Sever yourselves from such a man, whose breath is in his nostrils, uh, for of what account is he? Gracious Father, it makes us think in a moment, what account are we? Lord, who are we, Lord, that, that you would bless us so much? Who are we, Lord, that you would reach down from heaven and touch our lives and, and, and pull us up out of that pit? Who are we, Lord, Lord, to to look to you for the least of your mercies and your blessings. But, but here we are, Lord, we're your children, and we love you. And we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us and that you would guide us and help us to hear your voice today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You can be seated. Well, as we start off here in, uh, in verse 1, it says, the, Lord, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And so it, it kind of starts off the same way the first chapter did, and this is almost like uh, another prophecy uh, added to what he said in the first prophecy, uh, the word that he saw. You know, he, he's a seer. Uh, words typically, though, uh, unless you're smoking something funny, are things that you hear as opposed to things that you see. And so he, he, he says, Here's, here's the word that I saw. What that means is that, that as God spoke to him, there must have been some kind of corresponding uh, vision, you know, that went with that. And, and so the bottom line is that he sees, uh, he perceives, he hears things that others don't. And I pray because of the Holy Spirit working in us that we're the same way, that we see things differently because we, we walk with Jesus, that we hear things and perceive things and comprehend things differently because we're Christians. And, and that the world around us doesn't, doesn't see or appreciate many of the same things that we do. And, and so as we see the, the seer, as we hear his words, as we understand what he's given to us, we're, we're, we're in a privileged place. It's also directed at a particular people. He says the, the vision that he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. I, I say that because it's not the church. You know, there, there are people that, you know, that uh, would twist the scriptures in some ways to say, well, these are the things that, that God speaks of the church. No, he's very particular. This is about Judah and Jerusalem. Now, it's not that there isn't application for us. It's not that there isn't, you know, some correlations that, that, that would apply. And, and we can glean a lot from it. But we have to understand that this is directed at Judah and Jerusalem. Now, overall, this chapter constitutes really a rebuke to Judah for their apostasy, for their turning away, uh, from their turning away from God and the faith. But also, I believe, an encouragement to repent and an invitation this is an encouragement to those who are walking rightly in the midst of apostasy to
to keep walking rightly before the Lord. And that's important for us to know because as you go through this chapter, as we go through this book, you're going to see an awful lot. And you're going to be thinking, hey, that's us. Hey, that's our culture. Hey, that's, you know, that's our church. That's all these different things. And, and you want to know that, okay, that that's how the world is going, but we want to walk a different way. And we want to be, by the grace of God, faithful to him. And so, again, the invitation to keep doing that. Uh, in verse 2, he says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days uh, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the, the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. And so it shall come to pass. When? Well, it says here, in the latter days or in the last days. Now, bear in mind there, there's, there's two basic ways of looking at this or, 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 or two kind of um, fulfillments. So the first is figurative and the second is literal. Okay, figuratively... He says, now it shall come to pass in latter days that the mountains of the Lord, and, and the mountains equal kingdoms. And, and so when he's talking about the mountain of the Lord, he's talking about the kingdom of God. And the mountains are great kingdoms, and the hills are small kingdoms, and the nations are people. And, and so when you see it that way, you know, the, the, the kingdom of the Lord shall be established on the top, it'll have the highest priority, uh, and, and shall be exalted above uh, the other mountains, the great kingdoms of the world, and shall be exalted above the, the hills, the smaller kingdoms and all people shall flow to it. Now, he's about to describe the millennial age uh, because we are in the last days. And, and, and Paul describes the last days to us. He warns us of what's coming and what's going to happen. And in, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, the first few verses here, it says, But know this, it, it, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money and, and boasters and proud blasphemers disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Then he says, and from such people turn away. Don't hang out with them. Describing the same thing, honestly, to, uh, to Titus. He says in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, and I, and I think that this describes a, a big part of the church today. They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the posers that are out there. You know, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, but they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff that they shouldn't be doing. And so Paul's describing what the last days are going to be like. In, in Acts chapter 15, <clears throat> uh, um, uh, Peter is kind of called in on the carpet a little bit. He's been ministering to the Gentiles, and it's gotten back to the council in Jerusalem. And so they're having this council. What do we do with the, with the Gentiles? What do we do with the non-Jewish people, you know, that are coming to know the Lord? Do we, do we make them obey the law? Do we make them get circumcised? So they're having this big old council to kind of figure some of that stuff out. But in the midst of all that, at one point, James tells them, well, after, after this, after what? After God's work with the Gentiles, the church age, he's going to again focus on Israel. And understand that there was a time period in history where God focused exclusively, seemingly, on the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and what's going on there. And he was using them to provoke the rest of the world to jealousy. But as the Jews rejected their Messiah, and we talk about that in Matthew 24 and other places, as the Jews eventually rejected their Messiah, God turned his attention to the Gentiles. And even though some Jews do come to know the Lord as their Savior, the, the, the church is primarily made up of, of Gentile believers, and so it's the age of the Gentiles. But the age of the Gentiles is going to draw to a close, and I think fairly soon. And, and we're told that uh, one of the, the, the prophetic, uh, one of the requirements for that is when we hit the, uh, quote-unquote, the fullness of the Gentiles. When the last Gentile believer comes into the church, uh, and that's the trigger for the rapture, the, the believers will be caught up in the air, and God will again turn his focus back to the nation of Israel. And, and, and so that's kind of what he's talking about. And Revelation chapter 21 describes the, 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 the post-millennial, the, the kingdom age, uh, the new Jerusalem, where there's a new heaven and a new earth. And so he's covering a lot of ground here, okay? But we've talked about the figurative uh, application of this. I want to talk to you a little bit about the literal. Historically, uh, as we're going through the Gospels, uh, whenever anyone's going to Jerusalem, you'll notice that it always says we're going up to Jerusalem. Not, it doesn't matter if you're coming from the north down, from the south up, from the east, you know, to the west or whatever. You're always going up to Jerusalem. That's just a way of 
deferring to God's holy city. But there's a coming day, and, 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 and we talk about the great tribulation, all different things that are going to happen. There's a coming day where the, the Lord is going to, the, the, the temple of the Lord, the, the city of Jerusalem, is going to be elevated above all the mountains. What, what God's going to do is he's going to rearrange the earth so that Jerusalem is the highest place and everything else is lower. And so there's a figurative application of this, but I believe there's also the literal fulfillment of it, that when you look at the Great Tribulation time and what's going to happen during that time, it, it's horrible. I mean, a lot of people die, a lot of things happen, but he's also going to rearrange the real estate in such a way that everybody's always, whenever you go to Jerusalem, whenever you go to the temple of God, and, and, and all the people of the earth will at that time, they're going to be going up to Jerusalem because the kingdom is lifted up over all the rest. And so... Uh, all the nations shall flow to it. Every kindred, every nation, every tongue is going to basically go to the temple of God. In my Bible, maybe in your Bible, there's a, a reference on the side of verse 2 uh, related to uh, Micah chapter 4, verse 1. And, and the prophet Micah uh, prophesied uh, in, in a contemporary way to Isaiah. They were, they were roughly contemporaries. Not exactly, but pretty close. And people have debated, well, you know, who said it first? Is Micah quoting Isaiah? Is that Because Micah quotes this, or, or, or Micah has the same words, almost word for word, as Isaiah. And so the idea is, well, did, did uh, Isaiah hear it from Micah, or did Micah hear it from Isaiah? I don't know. But what I speculate, what I, what I believe, is that God spoke the same exact message to two different men of God, who then, as two witnesses, could witness to and against Israel if need be. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, a fact is established. And so I believe that God spoke to both the prophets the exact same thing so that when they are judged, so that when they are leveled, if you will, God can claim to be just in all of his ways because he warned them, he warned them twice. And so, you know, and the fact that he warns them twice gives you a clue as to how serious he is about this. Now in verse 3, describing the, the millennial temple and the kingdom age, he says, many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I love this. Uh, again, he's describing the, the millennial temple and the kingdom age. And Isaiah starts off describing the kingdom age with Jesus sitting on the throne and everyone worshiping him. Then he kind of digresses and, 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 and describes the time prior to that and the events that lead up to it, okay? Uh, and so you've got to understand the order of things. And the exhortation, the invitation is to come, to go up to the house of the Lord, wanting to be taught. I pray that when you come into the house of the Lord, that you desire to be instructed, that you desire to be taught as well. I hope you don't come in and just kind of fool around and say, ah, what you got for me today, huh? Hmm? Impress me. I'm not all that impressive, I know that. I trust that the Holy Spirit and the Word of God will impress you. I'm praying, I'm praying that God will teach you and instruct you today. But they, they're, in that millennial time, everyone's going to go with that expectation, I'm going to get something today. I'm going to learn something. I'm, I'm going to be taught. I'm going to be instructed. And that's what we try to do as we're here. But the exhortation, the invitation to come, to go up to the house of the Lord and, and wanting again to be taught. We read in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1, whoever loves instruction loves knowledge. But he who hates correction is stupid. <laughs> I kind of like how blunt God is sometimes. You know, uh, he just puts it out there. Jesus assured us in, in, in John chapter 14, verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all the things that I've said to you. That's the beauty of having the Holy Spirit living in you. You read your Bible, you study, you, you go to church, you do different things, and, and, and you're kind of immersing yourself in God's Word. And if you're like me, you just wish you could comprehend all of it. If, if you're like me, you wish that when you got done reading, you could remember everything that you read and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, but I'd lean on this promise <laughs> that when it's needed, at, the, at that moment, the Holy Spirit will bring it up. He'll remind me of those things that He spoke. I, I know that when I'm about ready to commit a sin, He sure reminds me. You know, it's like, ooh, remember the Scripture? Oh, huh. Okay. But there's other times when you're talking, when you're witnessing, and, and God will remind you of that. But it's the idea that many will come and say, let us come up, let us go up to the house of the Lord, the, the mountain of the Lord. And I like that because how do you get there? How do you get there? Jesus is the way you get there. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's how you get there. You get there through him. You get there by that relationship that you have in him, by abiding in him. In verse 4, he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people 
Uh, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so we see that during this time, Jesus is going to judge, uh, he's going to rebuke, and he's going, he's going to enforce righteousness. And, and, and actually, we're going to help him enforce righteousness at that time. But it, it's so cool because it's going, to be, it, it's going to be what you dreamed of. Don't you wish that things were right all the time now? Do you see people break laws? Do you see leaders and politicians break laws or do different things that just kind of aren't right? Go, that's not right. You know, and, and, and you wish that you weren't just like, like me, just a regular citizen, a person that really can't seem to affect anything. I wish I could make that right. Guess what? The day's coming when your, your, your prayers are going to be answered. Your dreams are going to come true. We're going to live in a time of righteousness. Oh, man, that's going to be so cool. We read in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15. Now, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. When he rules with that rod of iron, he's going to make sure that things are pretty you know, tidy and, and, and the way they're supposed to be. I like that. I like that because that's what I want now. You know, during the millennial time period, there won't be any wars. There won't be any tools of war. People won't uh, uh, be trained for it or all the different things. That come. You know, sometimes you have countries that are armed to the teeth, but they're not actually at war, but they're ready for it. But it's going to be different when not only are there not going to be any wars, but no one's going to be armed. They're, they're anticipating a war. I mean, it's just, can you imagine that? A, a time when there's just nothing like that? I mean, none of us have lived in our lives in a time when there hasn't been war somewhere on this planet. But to live in a time of absolute peace is going to be crazy. You know, military budgets are going to be diverted to agricultural development. Imagine what that would do. And, and, and I don't know if you're getting it, but this is a prophecy of hope and peace, not of doom and gloom. And you think, oh, we're going to study through the book of Isaiah. Oh, no, woe is me, all that stuff, right? There's, a lot, there's some of that in there. But you've got to look for those places in between where God demonstrates his grace. When, when God demonstrates, no, there's going to be a time of restoration. There's going to be a time where things are going to be made better and that we look forward to those times. In verse 5, he says, O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. I love this. He, he, he beckons the house of Jacob, the, the believers, those, those that are you know, his people. He says, come, you know, that invitation to come to him. It, it's just like the previous chapter in Isaiah 118 when he said, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they should be as white as snow. You know, they, they are red like crimson, they should be as wool. Come. He's beckoning us, beckoning us to come to him and to walk in the light. Interesting that, that Peter writes from the other side of things in a certain sense, you know, farther down after the fulfillment of some of this. And, and in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, <coughs> excuse me, we read that, but, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation his own peculiar people, that he may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He wants us to be with him in the light because he is the light. He wants us to abide in him and to walk in him. Do you guys remember what it was like to walk in darkness? I do. Uh, like a bad dream, I don't want to go back there. But walking in the light is so refreshing. It, 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 there's life. There's, your eyes are open. You're, you're awake. You understand what's going on around you. And, and it's just an awesome thing. And we're called to walk in that. He beckons us to himself. That's why Jesus told us in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. The invitation is to walk in the light, knowing that he is the light. In, in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus declares that he is the light. The Apostle John writes, in 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We're, we're, we're again, we're, we're children of light, just like Paul writes in uh, Ephesians 5, 8. For you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Understand what you are, then act like it. <laughs> okay. And we're children of light, so let's walk in the light. Now, in, uh, in, in verses 6 through 9, <clears throat> he enumerates uh, basically seven different things as to why they're going to get judged, why they're going to get spanked, in a sense. And, and he starts off, for you've forsaken your people, 
the house of, of Jacob because you're filled with eastern ways. Uh, they are soothsayers like the Philistines, um, <clears throat> and they are pleased with the, the children of foreigners. Uh, their land is also full of silver and gold, and there's no end of their treasures. Uh, their land is also full of horses, and there's no end of their chariots. Their land is also full of idols. Uh, they, they, they worship the work of their own hands, they, that which their own fingers have made. People bow down, and, and each man humbles himself. Then, I'm not sure if this is commentary by Isaiah, but then he says, therefore, do not forgive them. It's like they've, they've gone over some, quote-unquote, red lines <laughs> that they weren't supposed to. Now, it starts off, for you have forsaken your people. Now, in my Bible, the personal pronoun you and your, uh, they're both capitalized. So it kind of gives you a clue that it's talking about God. And if you change that to a lowercase and didn't know that, uh, you'd have to read on a little bit because later on in the, in the context when it says when Isaiah prays, don't forgive them, well, who, who forgives sins? God. And so we know that that personal pronoun is, is obviously referring to God. But he says that you, God, have forsaken your people. Now, I wouldn't say utterly forsaken because you know, there's a time of restoration coming up, so they're not utterly forsaken, but there's that time period where he's, he's turned away from them, he's, you know, he's pouring out his wrath upon them or his judgment, if you will, and, uh, and, and so I can't say that they're utterly forsaken, but he's explaining why uh, they've been forsaken for a, a time anyway, uh, basically because of their unfaithfulness. And then he gives us this list of seven different things. Remember, Isaiah likes seven. He likes to list things in sevens. And so we've got seven things that they've done. And, and the first one comes to us right there in verse 6. He says, because they are filled with eastern ways. They're filled with Eastern ways. To us, East might mean New Age practices or Hinduism, that kind of stuff. Um, but to them, East was Babylon. And speaking of Babylonian practices, now this might be a, 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 a difficult subject for some that, that are in the know on that, but be, because, well, on our website, uh, we've got a, a PDF version of a book entitled Two Babylons, by Alexander Hislop. And in this book, uh, he lays out the Babylonian practices, the worship of Tammuz and Semiramis and Ashtarte and the Queen of Heaven, and how these practices have been assimilated into Christianity in large part, uh, in a large part of the church. And, I'm, and I will tell you, not just the Roman Catholic Church. Protestant Christianity has embraced a number of Babylonian practices. And, uh, and, and people get pretty uptight when sometimes when I talk about it, because they like celebrating Halloween, which is satanic. They like the, the ways that they celebrate Christmas at times, which in part is, in, is adopted pagan practices. And I'm not going to get into a big study on that. <clears throat> you can look at the book if you choose to and, uh, and, and discover some of those things for yourself. But I tell you what, it altered the way my family celebrates Christmas. But the second point that he makes there in verse 6 is that they are soothsayers uh, like the Philistines. You know, that means that they're into sorcery and witchcraft and magic and fortune-telling and, and stuff like that. Oh, I'm not into that. Well, do you watch movies that portray that? Do you pay eight, eight bucks to go see it? Check it out. But they're soothsayers. You know, we're told in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 6, and the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. When, when God says you're doing these things and you're prostituting yourself, is that a good thing or a bad thing? He's saying you're being unfaithful in like one of the worst ways. You know, in a, later in that same chapter, in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 27, a man or a woman who is a medium or has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones and their blood shall be upon themselves. God's pretty hardcore about this stuff. The third thing that he mentions there is that they are pleased with the children of foreigners, meaning they've interme intermarried with the pagan people all around them. Uh, they've not kept separate uh, the way that the Lord told them to. It, it, it's stated in several places, but in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3, nor shall you make marriages with them. You know, people think, well, I'm my own sovereign being. I can choose what I'm going to do. And I can You're not your own sovereign being. You're a slave. You belong to Jesus. And 
He is the master of your life, theoretically. And so you need to ask him, can I have a, 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 a marriage or a relationship or this or that with another person or whoever? Our master dictates those things. And, and, and they were told not to do that. We're told, not, we're told the same thing. It's not just an Old Testament thing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and, and 17, Paul writes, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. We're called to have a, a, a certain kind of relationship with a certain kind of person. That's just how it is. The psalmist declares in Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Okay? Blessed is the man that doesn't hang out or, or engage you know, with those people in a certain sense. James tells us, he's kind of more hardcore on this, he goes, in, in James chapter 4, verse 4, he says, you adulterers and adulteresses, you, know, you unfaithful, he says, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You've got to choose who you're going to be friends with. It's kind of like, it, 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 it's either or. It's either God or the world. He's the one that lays that out. In uh, verse 7, he gives us the fourth thing. Uh, he says the, the, their land is filled with silver and gold, that there's no end uh, of their treasures. They're rich, they're wealthy, uh, they're well off, but they're not taking care of the poor. They're, they're neglecting the poor, and, and they're saying, hey, you know, the economy is good. And, and that's, you know, I remember there was a presidential slogan some years back, it, it's, it's the economy, stupid. It, 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 that's all that matters is what he was saying. And that's not all that matters. You know, <clears throat> They're well off, but they're not taking care of the enemy. The, 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 the condemnation against Sodom and Gomorrah, most people think, well, the big deal with that was, you know, homosexuality, you know, deviant, you know, sexual behavior. It's not, that wasn't the main issue. That was a symptom. The main issue is described in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49. See, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. When it, when it says that she, that, that she had uh, fullness of food, that means she was rich, well off. Idleness, that, that they had spare time, they had recreational time. They had all that, but they didn't lift a finger to help the poor. And, and that, that's why they were hammered. Uh, we read in, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus is rebuking the lukewarm Laodicean church. And he says, because you say, I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, I do not know that, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They didn't know their own state. Why? They were blinded. They were deceived. They were thinking everything is cool. They had a false sense of reality. What they really had was a false sense of assurance. Because Jesus was saying, you guys stink. Now, if you just look around and go, hey, I smell good, I look good, I feel good. Look in the mirror, oh yeah. But maybe we should not do those things as much as ask God, what do you think? <laughs> Lord, would you search my heart? Lord, would you try me and see if there's any wicked way in me? Lord, what's your assessment of my spiritual state? <laughs> then, then hang on. <laughs> because God is very faithful to reveal those things. The, the, the fifth thing he mentions there is that their land, still in verse 7, their land is full of horses and chariots, meaning they were strong militarily. David writes in uh, Psalm 20, uh, verse 7, he said, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So they were strong militarily, but they were weak spiritually, and they were steeped in materialism. Who's the strongest planet on the earth today we are we are who's the richest planet on the who's the richest nation on the, in the world today we are we are what are we trusting in i'm afraid it's not our military strength and, and our economy that could all change in a moment we need to have our faith in the one that never changes it's always there got to keep our eyes on. and sometimes in our prosperity and our strength all those different kinds of things it's actually harder to keep your eyes on jesus then than if you're dirt poor and weak. Because like the Laodicean church, you go, I've got everything I need. 
we've got to be very, very careful. I, I think there's application to us here in all this. In verse 8, we have the sixth thing. He says that uh, their land is full of idols. Do you guys understand that it's the mere presence of these things that offends God? I, I've tried to talk to people at times. I don't do it as much anymore. But, I, you know, sometimes, I, and, and don't get hinked up. If I come to your house and, and visit with you or something like I've done with people, people just run around and start cleaning stuff up. Like, you know, sometimes I just showed up with, my wife showed up with a pizza. Hey, can we have dinner with you guys? I know if I called you ahead of time, you'd say no, so here we are. We've done that. But I've tried to talk to people at times. And why do you have this big old dragon thing in your house statue? Or why do you have a Buddha? Or why do you have this or that? Oh, it's just a decoration. Well, you might think that. But I tell you what, God doesn't think that. I'm just saying. You know, I went through my house that way. And I'm not a legalistic, you know, fair. I'm trying not to be pharisaical. I'm just laying out. There are things that we think are okay We've just gotten used to thinking they're okay. But God doesn't always agree with that. And I think that we, we've been blinded at times. And I think we just got to be careful. I'm, and I'm saying these things, if I'm offending you, I, I'm kind of sorry. Um, you know, but in a way, I mean, I, I, my presentation can be offensive. I, I will never apologize for the Word of God. Okay, but sometimes my presentation can be worthy of an apology. But, but I'm just telling you, there's, there's things that people just don't think about. The land is full of idols, and the presence of these things offends God. In, in verse 9, we, we have the seventh thing, and actually it's a little bit of verse 8 and verse 9, uh, but it says the people bow down to these things. They bow down to these idols. And, and God hates idolatry. To him, it's spiritual fornication. It's adultery in his eyes because you, you're supposed to love me and be committed to me, but now you're worshiping somebody else. You're giving your love to them. Isn't that a picture of adultery? And that does not set well with God. And, you know, God's, quote, unquote, chosen people, the, the nation that he chose out of all the planet, if, he, if he's going to hammer them, and we're going to go through some hammering time, you know, if he's going to hammer them, the ones that he loves seemingly the most on this planet, do you think that we're going to be spared from that? Think again. And so this is serious stuff. The, 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 these, they're bowing down to these idols, and, and it's a violation, if you will, of the, the second commandment. In, in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, we're told you not to make graven images and not to bow down to them. God hasn't forgotten. They're not the ten suggestions. <laughs> and, and, and the foolishness of it anyway. I mean, we're going to go through this later on in Isaiah. So you, you cut a tree down, and, and you take some of that wood, and you put it in the fire, then you take another piece of wood, and you carve it into an image, and you bow down to the image. <laughs> That you made? Lame. And it goes on, and the psalmist declares in Psalm 115, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. In other words, our God is sovereign. He's able to do stuff. He says, but their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. And they have mouths, but they, they don't speak. They have eyes, but they, they don't see. They have ears, but, but they do not hear. They have noses, but they don't smell, although they do stink. Uh, they, they have hands, but they do not handle. They have feet, but they don't walk, nor do they mutter through their throat. They make these useless little gods that can't do anything. You've got to pick them up and carry them somewhere. If my God is small enough for me to pick up and carry somewhere, I don't need him because he's not going to help me out. I'm just going to take up space in my luggage. That's not the kind of God that is going to bail you out of anything or, or bless you or help you in any way. And he says... Those that make them are like them. Think about that. And so is everyone that trusts in them. In other words, you don't see, you don't hear, you can't speak truth if that's, if that's what we're doing. And so he's, he's pretty hardcore. And then in, in, in verse 9 there at the bottom part, he says, and each man humbles himself. People bow down, each man humbles himself. In the King James, it uses the word uh, uh, the mean man. He doesn't mean like unkind. He means average. And what he's saying is, everybody does it. it. It's not something that stands out. It's common practice. And sometimes we mistake socially acceptable for God acceptable. And they're not the same. I was talking to somebody about uh, 
letting their kids watch uh, witchcraft types of movies and stuff, you know? And you go, well, you know, uh, uh, the Greek mythology, I mean, that's part of the classic education. I said, well, it was wrong then, and it's wrong now. <laughs> Greek mythology, yeah, there's, there's schools and, and all kinds of stuff. You know, public schools you know, do the whole Halloween thing. So measuring the culture by the culture is a wrong move. We have to measure the culture by God's word. We have to let God's word define the culture, not let, as some people do, the culture define God's word. We got to keep the horse in front of the cart, and so. But then at the end of this, he's, he says, "Therefore, don't forgive them." Ouch! I mean, is this Isaiah or Jonah? You know, Jonah wanted Nineveh, Nineveh get judged, and and don't forgive them. We see later on that that God does work through. In uh, <clears throat> verse ten, he says, "Enter into the rock and hide in the dust, from the terror of the Lord, and the glory of His Majesty." So he's speaking of that day that is yet to come when, when men will hide themselves from the wrath of God. What I'm going to tell you is, listen carefully, you cannot hide from the wrath of God. You can't crawl into a deep enough hole. You can't go out in the woods far enough. There's no place where we can hide from the wrath of God. The only thing we can do is avoid it completely by surrendering to him, becoming one of his children, and then, then, like the Bible says, you are not appointed unto wrath. You're on his side. You're on the other side of that wrath. I want to be behind Jesus when this happens, not in front of him. And so there's no hiding from his wrath. And people can thumb their nose. They can say, God, I don't believe in you, all that kind of stuff. But there's a day coming when the, the reality of things will catch up to them. In, um, in Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, this is the opening or the breaking of the sixth seal in heaven. And it says there in verse 15, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. That day is coming, and I, I, I just beg you, if you're not ready, get ready. The only way you can be ready for this, by the way, is just to, to receive Jesus. It's an interesting thing. There's a pattern being set here. It starts off talking about the millennial kingdom, Jesus on the throne, everybody coming to worship him, and then it digresses talking about the wrath that's going to happen before that and, and, the, and the judgment that's poured out on, on the earth. But this actually kind of fills uh, or fulfills a, a pattern that we see in other places in the Bible. In, uh, in, in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 46, as Solomon is established on the throne, it says, thus the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. So there was that transition from King David. There was a little bit of uh, drama there, you know, with his uh, brother trying to usurp the throne, that kind of thing. But eventually King David, I mean, King Solomon is is is, is established on the throne in a way that nobody challenges. But the way that happens is that, you know, you might ask, he was established, in the, the, the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. How was it established? And we get the answer from the context there in, in 1 Kings. In 1 Kings chapter 2, verse, the first part of verse 46, it says, So the king commanded Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and he struck him down and he died, speaking of the king's adversaries. There were different people that were uh, challenging. There were different people that uh, were, were going to fight against Solomon and, and different people that fought against David. And Solomon commanded different men to go out and kill them, and, and they were killed. No one questioned the king's order at that point. And, and what I'm telling you is our Lord's eternal kingdom will be established pretty much in the same way. That Before the, the kingdom age is established, he's going to go through and clean up things and and deal with his adversaries and judge them, and then his throne will be established. In a, uh, we're all familiar with, especially at this time of the year, uh, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Uh, it, it's the, the famous kind of Christmas card verse. You know, uh, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and, and his name will be called Wonderful, 
Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So there you have your Christmas message. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Um, But the next verse is telling. Verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward and even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Now, remember last week I told you the different titles of God? The Lord of hosts is his warrior name. The zeal. That doesn't mean, oh, i got to go do this. No, he's coming with fire in his eyes. He's coming with a sword. He's coming like it's on. He's not going to slow down. He's not going to flinch. When he comes, he's going to deal with stuff. And we need to be ready for that. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you accept him, if you surrender to him, come to him on his terms, then you're ready. Then have confidence. But it, it, tell you what, it makes me want to talk to my neighbors more. It makes me want to talk to my loved ones. It makes me want to kind of like, you know, talk to people that I know that aren't, you know, quite right. You know, because you don't want them to go through this. So we, we see the same pattern laid out here in Isaiah. In verse 11, it says, The lofty looks of man should be humbled, the haughtiness of men should be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And so the, the lofty looks of men. You ever seen a college professor in his classroom? They give you a lot of lofty looks. I, I've seen a couple of college professors debating with different Christians about stuff, and, and just the arrogance sometimes. You know, I've been involved in a couple of those things, but just the, the arrogance they display. But I'm going to give you my own translation. It says here, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled. My translation is, the Lord is going to wipe that smile off your face. The Lord's going to deal with that. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and when he talks about the lofty looks, this is the first thing on a list of things that God hates. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, these six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him, and the very first thing listed, a proud look, an arrogant look, you know, uh, looking down at somebody kind of a look. God alone, Jesus alone, will be exalted in that day. His name, he will be lifted up. Like Paul writes in Philippians 2, 9, therefore God also, (coughs) excuse me, Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and of those in heaven and of those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That day is coming. We worship him now. We, we, we lift his name up on high now. We humble ourselves before him now, willingly, gratefully, excitedly. But there will be a day when the most vehement Satan worshiper, when the, when the most, I don't know, antagonistic Gnostic, <laughs> you know, or, or atheist or whatever, will bow their knee and confess that Jesus is Lord. Maybe through clenched teeth, I don't know, but they'll do it. And I'd rather do it voluntarily. In verse 12, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and upon and it should be brought low. So there's going to be a time of judgment. There's going to be a time of brokenness and humility. He's going to basically level the playing field. You know, we we talk about, we talk a lot about the day of the Lord. You know, that that terrible day of judgment, Jacob's trouble. We focus on that a lot, you know, prophetically. But do you understand what that implies in the other direction? That the, the, the day of the Lord is in contrast to the day of man. We're living in the day of man right now. We're, we're living in a time in this present evil age where God is permitting men to find their own way, to follow their own plans, to make up the rules as they see fit, if you will. Um, um, God is permitting men <clears throat> to be independent of his authority. There's someone who knows that God, God's allowing that. That's a day of man. But when the day of the Lord comes, all that's going to change. And, and in the day of the Lord, the high and the low, the rich and the poor, the, the learned and the ignorant, all alike, will be brought low before the Lord, who have defied and neglected the Lord, and they will be humbled. That's going to be a terrible day in a way. Terrible for them. 
verse 13, he says, upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and so referring to the, the groves and the places of idol worship and spiritual whoredom, you know, God is going to judge these things. Uh, in verses 14 and 15, upon all the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower and upon every fortified wall. And so upon all the things that we have confidence in, uh, you know, whatever you've got your hope in, uh, upon all of our quote-unquote little gods, uh, the mountains and, and the hills, the, the kingdoms big and small, the, the institutions, whatever it is that you look up to. I can remember as a kid going to New York City and standing in front of the World Trade Center and looking up and not really even being able to see the top. They just kind of went, go, you know, just this big old giant tall building. And I remember being, driving away from it and looking at it, you know, turning around the back seat, my dad was driving. And I'm looking back and going, wow, those are big buildings, thinking it'll be there forever. Guess what? Didn't take that much to bring them down, did it? Do you think God's going to have a hard time? I don't think so. But upon every high tower and upon every fortified wall, including those in our own hearts. Remember when the disciples tried to point out, hey, Lord, do you see the majesty of the temple? See how big the stones are? He says, hey, there's coming day when not one of these stones will be together. And they just couldn't fathom that because that temple had been there their whole lives. That edifice, that glorious thing, that was part of who they were. And there's probably things like that in their own hearts. But the bottom line is, all these things are going to be brought down and brought low because Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. You're not going to get to heaven and go, oh, I got it. Yep, yeah, I did it. You know, get all chicken chested with God. No, when you're there, you're going to be so glad to be there. And you're going to realize that he's more and more, that he's the one that got you there. It's his work. It's his, it's his completed work on the cross. Verse 16 continues. Uh, the things are going to be brought down. Uh, all the, upon all the ships of Tarshish, upon all the beautiful sloops, um, the ships of Tarshish kind of refer to commerce and and business dealings, uh, commercialism, if you will, and, and the money and the power that come from that, uh, that so many really have made their own, made their gods. Uh, verse 17, the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of man shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. That's the second time that that's been said. And so, um, uh, all these things are going to be brought down. One of the key issues in all this is their pride, their, their haughty looks, if you will. Uh, remember back to Proverbs uh, 16, 18. Uh, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so, uh, word of the wise there. Uh, verse 18, uh, but the idols he shall utterly abolish. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, the idols he shall utterly abolish. In... Um, in the first and second commandments, and you find this in Exodus chapter 20, I think it's good for all Christians to, to memorize the Ten Commandments just in general, and you find them there in Exodus chapter 20, but the first commandment is, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, essentially, is you're not to make any graven images of anything in heaven above, earth below, you're not to, you're not to bow down and to worship them. And so he's saying, basically, uh, that they have you know, they violated the, the first two commandments. And uh, <clears throat> in Isaiah 42, 8, it says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to graven images. I remember coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, coming across this verse, and really having to sit there for a little while and think it through, you know, because I was raised doing just that. And, um, and, and I had to figure out who was right and who was wrong in that scenario. <laughs> God's right, and I was wrong. But, um, but what I see there in verse 18 is, but the idols he shall utterly abolish. They've already been forbidden in the Ten Commandments. Now he's going to abolish them. And I had to look up the word abolish. In, in the Hebrew, it means to, to, to strike through, to pierce through, to, to stab. But I looked up in an English dictionary, and it means to do away with, to get rid of. God's going to take care of that business. Uh, in verse 19, they should go into the holes of the rocks, into the caves of the earth, 
uh, from the terror of the Lord. This is the second time the terror of the Lord has been mentioned. And the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. And so the preppers are out of luck. You know, the people that are building bomb shelters. I actually started to build a bomb shelter in my backyard years ago. I was thinking about the end times. I wasn't a Christian. I was just kind of new enough to know it was coming. And I had a big backyard. And I think, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to build a bomb shelter. I'm going to build a thing on my family, and I can go down in. And I, I bought some semi automatic weapons and a bunch of ammo, and I bought MREs, and I bought water. And I was really, I was getting serious. I was going to go through this. And I thought, then I, then I had to click. Well, what clicked was, in the middle of that process, I became a Christian. And literally, I sold my guns uh, and all my stuff, except what I needed for work. I sold that stuff for saws and drills and tools. I took my guns and turned them into plowshares and pruning hooks and used them in ministry. Because I realized one day, how many people am I going to kill to keep from getting my can of beans? Pork and beans, which is not really that good for you anyway. Or to to keep forgetting my memory. How how long can I hold out? And I realized I'm going to be killing a bunch of non-believers that I'm going to be sending them to hell. So the Lord really turned my heart. But the bottom line is, again, you can't hide from God. You, 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 it's just not going to happen. These, these bomb shelters, survivalists, preppers, whatever, they're going to be like rats hiding in a hole. And it won't do them any good. Those that are not covered in the blood of the Lamb will be terrified, and rightly so. Bless you. It, 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 again, Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. And the kings of the earth, great and small, the rich men, the, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man... Uh, hid themselves in the caves and the rocks and the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. There's no hiding from that. You have to deal with it up front. You have to accept Jesus. That's the only way to get out of that. It says when he arises to shake the earth mightily. As we travel through Israel, as I've traveled through different parts of the world, I've seen a lot of cities destroyed. Sometimes they get destroyed in war and bombing, artillery, that kind of thing. But most of the cities I've seen destroyed have been destroyed by earthquakes. That's, that's kind of like, <coughs> excuse me, God's MO. And um, uh, you'll see it later on, <coughs> excuse me, you'll see it later on in the book of Revelation, God uses earthquakes to level the playing field. He uses earthquakes as a method of uh, judgment upon culture, societies, and cities. And so here he's kind of describing the same thing. Paul writes to the Thessalonians in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, verses 8 and 9. He says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. Uh, right off the bat, I want to know God. And, and those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I want to obey the, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9, These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. There's just judgment. In verses 20 and 21, in that day a man will cast away his idols of silver and his his idols of gold, which they have made each for himself to worship, uh, to the moles and the bats, uh, to go in the clefts of the rocks and into the crags of the rugged rocks, from the terror of the Lord, third time, and the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake the earth mightily. (coughs) Men will be in such a terrified state that they will forsake their idols, the value of which, by the way, at this point is very clear. They're useless, so they toss them to the moles and the bats. And, uh, but even though they understand the value of these things, it doesn't necessarily mean that they repent of their sin. They're just, this doesn't work, we'll try something else, as opposed to doing what they should do. What this kind of portrays is what we read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men. God is limitless in His love, I believe. His grace seems to be infinite. His mercy overflowing. But there's a point in time when God literally draws a line in the sand and says, in essence, the jig is up. And He deals with things. And we need to be ready for that. He says that he's going to shake terribly the earth. He says that twice. In, in Haggai, when was the last time you heard a reference from Haggai? Uh, 
Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, in a little while, I will shake the heaven and the earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 12, 26, 27, if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a, f- a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Again, don't be an adversary to God. If you're listening to my voice, don't be at enmity with God. Surrender. Make peace with God. Allow Him to be your Abba Father. Allow Him to be your Savior. He doesn't want you to go through this. But there'll be many, sadly, that do. Then again, I mentioned that Revelation 5 talks about the different earthquakes that will happen. The last verse here, verse 22, sever yourselves from such men whose breath is in his nostrils. For for what account is he? You know, he's useless to you. Don't trust in men. Trust in God. Sever yourself from such a man. Well, such a man, what men are we talking about? (coughs) Excuse me again. Fighting off a chest cold. Such men. Men who reject God. Men who worship idols. Men who refuse to obey the truth of the gospel. Separate yourself from these kinds of people, idolaters or blasphemers, those who are engaged in those types of things. Who are your friends? Who, are you, who do you hang out with? I mean, he's talking to the nation of Israel. He's talking to Judah and Jerusalem. That, that's to them. But I think there's application here for us as well. We have to be careful who we're friends with. Paul writes to the Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. He says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. It's true. You become who you hang out with. I encourage you to hang out at church like a lot. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, read it earlier. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You have to deal with unbelievers. You, you have to work and do things. But it, there's a difference between being yoked with them, that you engage in relationships with them. You, you can witness to them. You can share with them. We should. I pray you are. But it doesn't mean that your best friends hang out all the time. <clears throat> Because if you're not influencing them, then they're influencing you. Just how it is. We read in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26, the righteous, that's anyone that believes in Jesus, the righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. We've got to be careful. Proverbs 13, 20, he who walks with wise men will be wise but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Now, who's a wise man? Who's a fool? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's not just that you, you, you know, I've got lots of friends that they have dumb friends. I'm talking about me. I'm not talking about intelligence, IQ. We're talking about what's a wise man? A wise man's one that knows the Lord. He's made the right decisions about life. A foolish man? He's done the opposite. <clears throat> Last reference I want to give you, uh, turn to the right in your Bible to Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> and look at verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Jesus is the light. He is given you the, the, the light of his word. He's given you the light of his countenance and of his glory. He has revealed himself to you. And like, like the writer said earlier, come, let's, let's walk in that light. Let's abide there. Let's live there. Because that's where he wants you to be with him, in that light. And he shine that light on you. Let him light up your life. Let him light up your heart. Walk in the light. Gracious Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for sending your son. We thank you for the nativity. Father, we thank you for this warning. Lord, it's some serious stuff. It's it's heartbreaking stuff. But Lord, we ask that you just help us to to respond to you appropriately and to, to love you on your terms. 
Guide us, Lord, by your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, hey, if you're able, to stand together and uh, we'll continue to worship. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. No longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me.
child of God. No longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Gracious Father, we're, we're grateful to be your children. Lord, we're grateful to have that close, that deep, that intimate relationship with you. Lord, as your children, we're, we're, we're grateful to be preserved, Lord, protected from the wrath. That, Lord, you took that wrath upon yourself on our behalf. We thank you for our salvation, Lord. We thank you for your blessings to us today. Guide us, Lord. Help us to walk in the light as you are in the light. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up. upon thee and give thee peace. Well, Merry Christmas, you guys. I pray the Lord just continues to bless you and to open up your eyes to who He is to you and, and how much He loves you and, and what the Nativity is really all about. I pray He continues to speak to your hearts through the day and, and just to, to minister to you. Have a great day. God bless you. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up afterwards. So myself and the others, we'd love to pray with you. God bless. And there's a potluck after the second service. If you can come back for that, you're going to have a great time.